Hello again. Apologize for my very casual attire. It's been a little, like I said, crazy at home and trying to find a perfect balance between Shayla's order and my controlled chaos at home. There's a funny skit that I kind of wanted to play um, where this wife comes home and I think and she is stressed out with everything that's going on and she's just like I can't take it anymore there's too much to do too much to take care of and you know she you can tell she's just really stressed out with life and the 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 guy the husband is like like reluctant he's like all right I don't want to say this because I didn't want to jinx it I was worried if I said it it would stop happening. But let me show you something. And he takes her to the coffee table. He's like, all right. If whatever is, you know, whatever is too much is to handle, you just put it on the coffee table. Like I put pizza boxes on it and dirty clothes and, and dirty napkins. And the next day, it's all gone. It's all taken care of. It's like, if you just do that, put all your problems on there, it'll be taken care of. And, you know, she rolls her eyes and... He goes to the next scene, and the police are over. And he's like, "Oh my, my gosh, my, my wife! She didn't, she didn't, she she disappeared. She, she must have sat on the table and she disappeared." And yeah, it's, just, it's kind of a funny skit. It's like a minute and a half, but that's kind of what's going on right now at home, like trying to take care of laundry and things that I don't normally do. And uh, you know, Shayla Shayla takes care of it all, you know, and I'm. Yeah, me, so sad, yeah, I know, so sad, yeah. But I, I'm realizing, you know, the, the value she adds to our household in so many ways. Um, so, uh, anyways, <clears throat> uh, we're going to be talking about the righteousness and wrath of God. <clears throat> and Paul's teaching about why a society... Uh, degenerates into unrestrained, corrupt, destructive evil is unlike any assessment you would read today. Paul writes through God's divine inspiration that when a society is sinking into moral decay, one of the traits of that um, decay is the inability to see what is happening. The mind becomes so flawed and the moral, immoral, excess that it doesn't have the ability or the basis to recognize evil for what it really is and we do indeed live in such a time the inability to render sound moral judgments is evident wherever you look and i believe that this passage of scripture is one of the most relevant and needed texts in the bible for today in our day because what it says is so foreign to the to the modern readers of our worlds What we need is a message from outside our defective worlds and our depraved thinking. We need a message from God. And that message reminds us of the consequence of sin. We need to be reminded of God's wrath. God abhors sin. And we need to call um, the moral ambiguities of this world for what they really are, sin. When we recognize the consequence of sin, how more beautiful is the righteousness of God? When we recognize the total depravity, destruction, and misery, and futility of sin, and we compare it to the life-giving gospel, we can fully comprehend what is better. And we need the righteousness, I want to say this a lot for the sermon, we need the righteousness of God because it is the only thing that can protect us from the wrath of God. As verse 17 in our passage of Romans, for it says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteous will live by faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, um, as we come to your word today, I just ask that we would have open hearts and minds to your scripture, to your word that is revealed to us, that your spirit would be convicting us of what your word has to say. And that um, as we read it today, that we would have an appreciation, a love 
for your word, that we would acknowledge you, Lord, as the, the, the God, the creator of this, of this universe, and that we would love you and love your righteousness. We say this in your name. Amen. Well, um, uh, last week, Jim did a wonderful job of opening up our, our passage of Romans as we're going through our study of Romans. And he talked about um, the calling that you're called. And <clears throat> today, I'm going to be talking about kind of revelation, revealing in our, in our passage. So we're going to be looking at how righteousness is revealed, wrath is revealed, and the gospel revealed. So he, he, he says, he talks about this revelation. Um, and we're going to look at some context. So my passage today is Romans 1, uh, verses 18 through 32. And I kind of have to go and look at verse 17. So we're going to look at that, verse 17, before we go into our passage uh, today and then talk about the lovely topic of wrath because everyone, you know, everyone's looking forward to that. Um, so, um, <clears throat> got to cover verse 17. Uh, we want to look at the connection between verses 17 and 18. It's namely because of that, that for or because. In verse 17, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why does Paul introduce verse 18 with the word for or because? He does this in order to show that everything he is going to say about sin and the wrath of God is meant to support the gospel message which reveals the righteousness of God. So he's going to be dealing with this topic of sin for the sake of the gospel. Understanding sin as part of the foundation that upholds the preciousness of the gospel and highlights how far apart we are on our own compared to the righteousness of God. If we recognize sin for what sin is and the consequence of sin, which is the wages of death going to hell, then we realize we need salvation. I'm going to get myself kind of canceled here, but homosexuality is sin. It's evil, just as deceit is sin and gossiping is sin. And being arrogant or greedy is sin and evil. We need to call those things for what they really are. And when he says here in verse 32, he says here in, our, in, this, in the, day, the day and age that people are giving approval of those who practice these things. We are desperately trying to take away the consequences of our actions. In verse 18, it says, he tells us why this gospel of the gift of God's righteousness is so desperately needed. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. We need the righteousness of God because it is the only thing that can protect us from the wrath of God. And we need to be protected from the wrath of God because we are unrighteous by nature and suppress the truth of God. By our nature, we don't like God, and we don't want him in our lives. It's important that we have an understanding of sin and wrath because it makes you wise about our human condition. If you are wise about the nature of the human soul, you will be able to fight your own sin more successfully, and you will be able to bless others more deeply with your insight and counsel. So what do we know about the effects the effects of sin. Paul describes for us the effects of suppressing the truth of God. We get categories of what the ungodly do. They reject God, suppress God, distort God, recreate God in your own image, to your own liking, and the effect is worse than we expect. Part of God's um, revealed wrath today for our sin is that God joins our crusade and delivers us into the shameful effects of our own rebellion against him. It occurs three times. In verse 23, 
We exchange the glory of our God for images. And he goes on to say, therefore God gave them over to the lust of their hearts. And again, in verse 25, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And so what does God do for this reason? God gave them over to degrading passions. And lastly, in verse 28, did not fit, see fit to acknowledge God. And so God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which, which are not proper. <clears throat> and this is what Paul means by the wrath of God being revealed. God's wrath is being revealed against this world as human beings all over the world set their affection on other things more, uh, more than God. And God's response to this worldwide disloyalty and treason against our creator is not first to send us to hell or that a bolt of lightning would, would smite the evildoer, but to see that we see, sink deeper into the swamp that we have chosen. And the root problem is that we don't like having God in our knowledge. They did not, it says that they did not see fit to acknowledge God. And that is the fundamental, oh, I missed a slide here. That is the fundamental problem of the world. That, that is the essence of the human condition. We don't want to acknowledge God. We want self-purpose, <clears throat> self-admiration. As we choose to ignore God, our minds become more and more defective to, in sin. So we are handed over to all kinds of evil. <coughs> and Paul goes on to list uh, 21 of them as examples. <clears throat> he says in uh, verse 28 through 31, Furthermore, just as they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they would do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And to be clear, this is not the way of all unbelievers. I think the point he's making here in this list is not to say that every society that refuses to love the true God will look just like this. Paul says that homosexual desire is a result of not loving God above other things and being handed over and, it's, and being handed over by God. And yet Paul doesn't, it clearly does not think that every unbeliever has homosexual desires. So it doesn't mean that every unbeliever or group of unbelievers has all these sins or in the same measure. Instead, these are examples. They're sort of the, the sort of thing that comes from rejecting God. And the more God gives a people up to their own unrestrained depravity, and the more their society as a whole will have these uh, sins in greater and greater measure as time goes on. And the more a society rejects God, the more we will see the society sink into depravity. And I believe this list of sins has to do with the rejection of God. People don't acknowledge him in their, li in their life, so he gives them over to these evils. So <clears throat> if our corporations are greedy, if our politicians are deceitful, if we gossip behind each other's backs, if we are untrustworthy and we don't keep our marriage vows, it has to do with a lack of acknowledgement towards God. We need to know God. We need to glorify God, give thanks to God. If you don't, the consequences are clear. If any of you here <clears throat> today are finding that you are sinking in sin, it is because you are as they are in verse 28. They did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, and you are doing what you ought not to be done. So what's the point of listing all these sins? I think it's to give us examples to show us that virtually every form of evil comes from failing to know God and approve him in our lives and showing love to him above all things. God gives us a sweeping array of evils to awaken us to the fact that the ruin of any life comes from owing an abandonment to God. So we can say that sin is rooted in our preferring something else to God. And every sin gets worse as God takes away the restraints and gives us to sink into the swamp even more. You know, you made your bed, now it's time to sleep in it. 
<clears throat> and I seen this example um, with my own children. I've been in a room with them, and I'll watch one of them push the other or take something from their hands, and I'm literally standing there, and I'll come up to the, the offender, and I'll say, why is your sister crying? I was there. I, I saw what happened. I already know what, why she's crying. You know, but I'm asking her, why is your sister crying? You know, it's like, you know, God going to, you know, Cain, like, where's your, where's, where's Abel? Like, God knows, right? But I, and I already know, and I'm there and literally seeing everything. And I'm, I'm giving my, my daughters a chance. Because, you, know, you know, I'm giving them a chance to tell the truth. And sometimes they, they hand themselves over to a greater judgment. Because not only am I giving them a chance to tell the truth, but I'm also giving them a chance to lie. And oftentimes they, they choose to lie. And it, it confounds me because I, I'm there in the room and I'm seeing what happens and they, you know, they invent some new way of like, oh, well, I didn't see her standing there when I pushed her. You know, that's like a, an excuse I've heard. I didn't see her, you know, or I wanted it more. You know, I wanted it before she wanted it, so I took it, right? You, you know, you invent these ways of doing evil. And unfortunately, they, they lie, and they choose something, and then that leads to more consequence because they lied. But we, we do that, right? You and I do that. We don't have a physical manifestation of God. There's no burning bush, right, or a pillar of fire in the room when I think I'm alone, and I can turn on my computer and my phone, and I know I can delete the browsing history because no one will ever know, or I'm counting money for my, my, my business. Well, you know, I, I won't do this, but you know, you know, counting money for business, I don't think no one's gonna see me steal money, right? Like I can get away, no one's gonna miss $100, right? No one's gonna know that I did this. But God, God knows. He sees all things. Nothing, it says in Hebrews chapter four, verse 13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We're going to have to give an account to the Lord someday for the things that we do. Lastly, I think a, a thing that we see from this list, um, <clears throat> as believers, um, our society, what we see our society is going, the direction it's choosing makes it really clear for us to know where people stand. Like literally one generation ago, you, you could say, well, yeah, there's some problems in our society, you know, you could say there's some, there's some minor issues, but you can see now, today, the restraints are being removed. Things are, are getting worse, are progressing. Things that you wouldn't have said a generation ago are now being said and applauded. You're so brave. You're so brave for, you know, being, choosing to be who you want to be. And, you know, good job. You know, I was out in the park with my family in Oregon City, and I, this church, and you kind of wonder, you know, at what point is a church no longer a church? You know, they, they have the sign on the, on the, the entrance of the, above their building with all the, the pop phrase, you know, cultural references of the day. You know, love is love, and, you know, all genders are equal and whole and beautiful, and you, you just wonder, like, that's what's on, there's nothing about Jesus, you know, on their, on their building. You know, I, it's so above there, you know, I kind of hope that they just keep adding more phrases to the list so that it reaches to the, the full floor of the door so that you can't enter, because they're going to run out of room eventually, you know, if they keep adding things to it. But we see, you know, as Paul's talking about, we see the wrath of God, the, the unrestrained things that are, un, you know, he's, he's opening the floodgates, and we're seeing what's, what's unveiling right now. And we get to, we now we know where people stand, where churches stand, and what is our, gonna sta what is our stance going to be on sin? Are we going to applaud people for it, as, they, as Paul warns, or are we going to say, no, we're not going to allow that. We're going to say this is sin. You know, we, we can love the sinner, hate the sin, right? We can, we can talk to them and educate them and, and show them the message of God. And that's what the point is. We're seeing the, the wickedness uh, 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 being unfolded. And, and as I see, as we see the degradation, the desperation, the depravity, it makes me long for Christ's return all the more. Like, as I see things unfolding, all I can think to myself is, 
Come, Lord Jesus. Please come. This world is, is falling apart. But that, another good thing as we're going to go and look into the, the, the gospel is that God is merciful. He's withholding, as, as we, you know, the next chapter in Romans 2, and he's talking about that there's a, he's holding, withholding his wrath, and we're, you know, he's, you know, we, we, God is hold, withholding his wrath. He's merciful. And he's going to, he's, he's waiting so people would come to be saved and know him. That's, that's something that, you know, we can praise God for. So, <clears throat> um, again, we, we need the righteousness of God because it is the only thing that can protect us from the wrath of God. And we're going to look at the last point, the gospel reveals. What does the righteousness of God provide other than the escape from wrath? And the answer to that is what the whole book of Romans is about. We need to overturn God's wrath against our unrighteousness, to say no to sin and be transformed from slaves to sin to slaves to righteousness. And the good news is that our God has provided that for us. You don't have to sink any further into sin when you embrace God and his provision. The key verse to all of this brings us back to where we started. In order to reverse God's wrath, Against, what, <clears throat> against us, we have to look to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. And the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God, is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In other words, the righteousness that God demands from us, he freely gives to us. If we will turn to him and trust, to, trust him to, for our greatest good. And we've been spending a lot of time... Uh, talking about repentance and the kids talk and it's they give a really they give a good elementary uh, definition of repentance <clears throat> this is the the theological definition the systematic theology definition of repentance repentance is a heartfelt heartfelt sorrow for sin a renouncing of it and a sincere commitment to forsake it and walk in obedience to christ when you turn to God and repent uh, of your sin in your life, God is quick to forgive. And throughout the book of Romans, Paul addresses many of the promises that address the issue of sin. And the, the changing of God, the changing of God handing us over to a depraved mind in Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were handed over. It's the same, same connection between Romans 1, uh, verse 28. And then the changing of our defectiveness, the defectiveness of our mind is in Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what, will be of God, what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. And as we come... Uh, to the end, as we as, we as believers, have, we have much to rejo rejoice. The issue of wrath and sin supports the gospel message. God's wrath reveals how sin leads to death, futility, and misery. Those who are sinking in the swamp are, of sin are miserable, lonely, and depressed, poor, unfortunate souls in pain and in need of the gospel message. But for us, as we witness the wrath of God unfolding, we can rejoice because that is not our fate. For believers in Christ, death is the door to paradise. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death to this world is not the end for us. That's one of the, the promises of the gospel. Futility and suffering are pathways to our sanctification. For believers, futility is removed from suffering. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose, all things work together for our good. Punishment is transformed into purification. Destructive forces become disciplinary forces. And lastly, the power of sin is replaced with a love of righteousness. 
But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. Not only is the sting of death replaced with hope, futility and suffering replaced with meaning, but also the enslaving power of sin with a, is replaced with a love of righteousness, which is the point of Romans 6. God does not, give it, does not give us over to a depraved mind. He gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we need to awaken to the truth of Romans chapter 1, verse 18. That the wrath of God is being revealed now in this age against the ungodly and the unrighteous of, uh, unrighteousness of man. We can't understand the world or the gospel without that truth. But let us also awaken to the truth that God is revealing something else at the same time. As he is revealing his wrath, he is also revealing the gift of his righteousness for all who believe on Christ. And with that righteousness, there is no wrath or condemnation for, on us anymore. For you who believe, death becomes a door to paradise. Suffering becomes a pathway to holiness. And the power of sin is replaced with the love of God's righteousness. So let us flee the wrath of God and take refuge in the precious power of the gospel of God. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, this, um, this is a difficult topic to, 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 to learn about, to study, that you, Lord, are handing over people to more and more sin, that you are opening the gates to, our, to, to, the un, to the destruction of the ungodly. And as we, as we witness this, you are also revealing your righteousness and your holiness, that it is far better to be with you, Lord, than, than sinking in, in, into sin, into the swamp of sin. Lord, help us to, to realize that you are holy and we need you in our lives. That without you, we can accomplish no good thing. Help us to, um, to be a witness of your gospel message to, to those around us. Help us to, to share your good news that you've come um, to save us from our sin, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sin and you raised him from the dead, and that we have that future hope and others can have that future hope. And we thank you, Lord, for that message that we get to share. We say this in your name. Amen.